Um, I'd like to read um, a statement um, about uh, a beloved teacher that we lost this week. Um, this past weekend, the Madison community lost a beloved father, husband, teacher, and coach in Mr. Dave D'Alessio. Madison Public Schools has been David's home for many, many years. David was a 1982 grad of Hand High School, excelled in math, ranking among the best in his class. He was a state championship wrestler. He began teaching in Brown in 1989 and then permanently at Polson ever since, since 1992. He's been in our system for many years. Dave was the head wrestling coach at Brown, Polson, and Hand over his career. He was inducted into the Daniel Hand High School School Athletics Hall of Fame as an athlete and an accomplished coach. He won the All-State Coach of the Year on multiple occasions. <clears throat> Dave was a relentless spirit of positivity. He connected with his students and his athletes and his colleagues in ways that can't be described by mere cliches. He lived his life for others. His family, his students, his athletes, and just about anybody who needed a jolt of positivity in their lives. These are all attributes that are well known about Dave. However, few people know he was also a master griller. He can use a smoker to cook just about anything, from smoking cheese to meats. He was extremely talented and creative in building things, including his own daughter Haley's car. He was also a master electrician, as Polson teacher Deb Thomas can attest, as they've wired and rewired their house many times on his own downtime. There wasn't a project he couldn't fix. <clears throat> if I were a first year teacher, I would take a walk down the main hallway at Polson today, and I would read literally hundreds of comments written by students about Dave. And I would use that as a benchmark, not only as a teacher, but as a person. As one student wrote, Dear Mr. D'Alessio, you've impacted my life and my future. The time, these are times well spent learning in your class. They've allowed me to see that good people really do exist. Your smile brightens so many lives. <clears throat> each and every day. The stories about your camping trips, the whipped cream cans, coaching, Jim and Derek, etc., the little soda tabs, the fun trips, past students you've talked about and so much more showed us that you loved your life. You put passion into teaching, hope, and hard work into each and every one of your students and always gave everyone a chance. You were so influential on everyone's lives. Thank you for teaching me about rocks, weather, waves, lungs, the digestive system, and the heart. Both scientifically and as a person, you have the biggest heart out of anyone, any human I've ever known. That's just one of hundreds of statements on that poster down the hallway at hand at Polson. <clears throat> Dave passed away quietly in the presence of his family late Saturday night. What he took with him can never be replaced. What we left behind will inspire and console the saddened ones grieving their loss. He left behind a spirit and a model of how to live a life, a legacy for his family, friends, and generations of students. He leaves behind what every teacher aspires for when they begin their vocation. The entire Madison community will be, has been fortunate to have worked with him and our students for so many years, he'll be deeply missed. Can you please have a moment of silence? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I need a motion to enter into executive session. So moved. Second. <laughs> oh, we're going to excuse ourselves for a few minutes and then we'll be back. I got it. You got it? I got it. A senior moment, sorry. Oh, it's awesome. Until they come back. All right.
Fire it up. Francois Macklin, you're still chair of the concert meeting? You're not. Okay. Here's the chair. I'll give everybody a little bit. Back at it. Um, item number three. Give a recognition. A recognition in this room. So the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education uh, annually designates March as the uh, CAVE board member, board member Appreciation Month. And in front of each board member at your seat tonight is a small token of appreciation on behalf of the district, staff, students, the parents. Um, there is a, a, an increase in your pay, doubling your pay this year. <laughs> I negotiated that with the personnel committee. Um, but for all the time, the energy, the commitment it takes, um, if one board should be paid in, in municipals, I won't say Madison, anywhere, it's probably the Board of Education, <laughs> the amount of time it takes to volunteer and the work that you all do here. And it's a very small token, but please accept that on our behalf. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Thank you. Shopper. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, thank you. Um, is there any member of the public who would like to speak? Okay. Um, Jackie and Eric, take it away. Do you have a uh, student representative report? Uh, so I'll start it off. I'll start it off on a little bit of a high note. Uh, <laughs> the hockey team beat uh, Guilford on Monday 7-0 in the first round of states. Wow. Uh, Who was the goalie in that game? <laughs> 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 uh, but on a little bit dreary of a note, the school is kind of sad today since everything's now canceled and no one can kind of finish oh. thorough with all these achievements that we've had, especially the seniors. You're all champions. Yeah. <laughs> But so that's, um, it's, Eric, if I can interrupt for one second, and I'll yeah. talk about this in the, um, the yeah, the coronavirus update. But the CIAC, I shared with the board uh, via email, but just for the public, the CIAC canceled all of their state tournaments, their playoffs um, this morning, um, really without any forewarning. We had no idea. Uh, there was not a postponement, which I anticipated we would put everything on pause try to brainstorm some options, some empty venues maybe so the kids can compete and play. Um, Eric, you're a junior. Uh, you might not get this opportunity again, and I'm so sorry. You know, um, I think you will, because you guys are that good and you're that good. But your senior friends are yeah. heartbroken for because there are kids that are going down the path of their very last events, and they're not going to have the chance to stand on the court or feel the play with mom and dad in their last game, knowing it's their last game knowing they have to pay to get in next time. <laughs> um, but, um, I, I, you know, I walked the halls today and talked to a lot of kids and saw a lot of weepy kids and it was very sad and I'm sorry for that. Well, uh, Bring us back up, Eric. <laughs> 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 um, I think Jackie can do okay. it. Come on, Jackie. <laughs> Jackie, right it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can do this. You're <laughs> captain. <laughs> captain Jackie, take it away. This past weekend, I had their Connecticut Classics at our school. And I went, and it went like so late. I think I was there until like almost 2 in the morning. One morning. Two, in the <laughs> two, which was actually 3 yes. because of the bus. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, that was for yeah. 6.30 in the morning. 6.30 in the morning, yeah. But that was really, it was amazing like all the schools performing were amazing like the yeah. sound system that they had i think they got a new sound system last year so it's like these it was guys awesome. paid for it yeah. <laughs> five sta yeah. six states represented yeah over yeah. two thousand competitors yeah. um, and if i could just quickly steal your thunder for a minute and just a shout out to the custodial oh. staff um we had extra custodial staff given the health concerns um, that are happening and they were incredible. Yeah. Smiling, happy, wiping down railings, two hour, every two hours cleaning the bathrooms. They were on it, they were present, they were enthusiastic, they were caring. Um, so, big shout out to, to the custodial staff. So. so yes, that was our vibe competition. And then kind of back down again, we have finals starting next week. So. <laughs> <laughs> not for you, not us. <laughs> we are <laughs> Yeah, so mine. Yeah. 
well, most of my AP classes will be wrapping up this trimester, which is yeah. good for me. But good for you. Good. Yeah. So we'll have half days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Excellent. Good luck. I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> Spring musicals coming. Oh, right. Cinderella. So spring musical yes. Cinderella is that end of April? So good. I'm not sure. I'm oh, <laughs> bang for <scars. laughs> All these yeah, things. Right. Sorry. Yeah, okay, fun. moving on. Okay. <laughs> Everything's kind of a fun one tonight. All right, not tonight because we have a champion in the audience who's going to present. Um, we're really lucky. Like, like, Fran Brady's been uh, quite. Come on up. Come on up. Okay. Fran Brady has been Turn quite on. a champion. You want to? Yeah, can okay. you fire that up for yeah. Um, a champion for all of our eco efforts around the town. Um, Mad for Earth is going to share with us tonight, and um, he's been in connection with our curriculum folks since the summer and, and beyond. So it's great to have Fran here. Thank you for joining us. Thank and you. when Gail fires you up, it's all you. I'll introduce myself first. Uh, I am. Fran Brady, I am a former chairman of the Conservation Commission here. Used to meet in that room over there. Mm -hmm. I am currently the uh, chairman of BYO Madison, which was the organization that helped uh, ban plastic bags officially in Madison and not have to wait a year and a half. <laughs> and I am married to the chairwoman of Madison's Pollinator Pathway Project. So, with uh, St. Patty's Day just a week away, right. mm -hmm. there's a lot of green in my household. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if this works. There it is. Okay. So this is um, a, pres a modified presentation that I gave to the Board of Selectmen, and after doing that, I was asked to come and share it with you. So I'm so glad I could, mm -hmm. because this presentation is really about the youth of Madison. I'm sorry, my back. Um, <coughs> And, and it, I'm looking at this from a environmental point of view. So before our children become adults, and that's only a short period of time, Madison has at least three important things to think about. Number one, uh, you just drive on 79, drive anywhere, you walk through a state forest, and you'll know that this is true. This is a report from uh, one of our newspapers. Millions of trees are dying from a combination of things. Uh, some of them are being cut down on purpose because we, you know, we have things that fall down on, on our power lines. But there is an unbelievable invasion of pests, and there's uh, vines that are strangling our trees. There's been drought and major storms. We're just knocking trees over, and, and I personally have had eight trees cut down in my house. Yeah, I just saw there's, there's a tree been cut down over here, too. There, every house almost has a tree that's been cut down. That's number one. Uh, these are the bad guys, emerald ash borer, southern pine beetle. And this is, this is just three of the bad guys. There's a whole bunch more. And I wanted to you know, make you aware of this. Um, number two is rising sea levels. It's, this is such an important topic that uh, we have formed a, a board or a commission to look into this. We had a plan built in 2016. This is a map from that plan that shows with just a category two storm, uh, a lot of the uh, beachfront is flooded. It doesn't mean you get washed away, but it's, it's you, you'll have standing water on the ground like we did with Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy. <coughs> and the official guideline is 20 inches by 2050. That is the conservative number. Number three, this is my pet peeve, is the trash. There's just trash everywhere. I mean, maybe I'm sensitized to it. I see it everywhere. Um, I see blue Bud Light cans everywhere. Uh, this is just, you know, every, every couple weeks, my wife and I pick up trash in Hammonasset Beach, the same area. Here's pictures of it. I'm a geek. I weigh it, I take pictures of it, because I, I'm, a, I'm a, a former scientist, so, oh, by the way, I am retired, so I get to do this all day. All right, but on April 25th, Madison can join a global meet, movement, not just a local one, a global movement. It, it's going to be the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. It's been 50 years, 50 long years. How many remember Earth Day? Anybody? All right, are you there? Um, it's a big event. Tens of thousands of events are going to happen. This is this is about a month ago. I took this picture, a screenshot, and we have a button. We're one of the dots. We are mad for Earth, and we are going to have an event. And what we're going to do, we this is our um, my, our uh, branding. We're going to continue doing the green up cleanup that we've done for the last ten years, but we're going to make it bigger. We're going to make it. Uh, we're going to expand it. So here's what we're going to do. Um, the theme, by the way, for Earth Day, there's always a theme. It's climate action. 
and I just came out of um, uh, Brown fourth grade classroom yesterday, and they're still working on action, uh, taking it that, that your actions can have an impact on, on the world. Mm -hmm. And I'll be there on Thursday, taught, giving them a, a, a simpler version of this presentation to get them excited, get them involved, to get them to do action. So I want to take it up a notch, as I said. Oh, before I go further, on the right is the proclamation. The Board of Selectmen officially proclaimed April 25th to be the Earth Day event for Madison. Um, we want to excite the youth. This is so important. I want to get them involved. Um, I have over there a Time Magazine, Time of the Year cover of Greta Thunberg. She has inspired me. I hope she inspires the youth of our town. I want to have our town participate in this, the largest environmental volunteer event in the world, in history, ever. This, the, the last biggest was 50 years ago, at the last Earth, the first Earth Day. This will be even bigger. Third, I want to have a lasting impression with, with everyone, youth and adults, so that they go away knowing that they want to make every day Earth Day, not just the, every, actually the official day is April 22nd. That's Wednesday, it's always April 22nd. But you can celebrate any time during that month. But we're going to do it on Saturday. So we are coordinated with the town of Madison. Uh, we're going to do the part one, the, the green up, clean up. It starts at 8 o'clock. I'm going to spice it up with a scavenger hunt, mm -hmm. see how many uh, interesting things you can find. I'm going to encourage the teams to take photographs. We'll try to document it. Part two is the news park. News park. And this is where I need your help. I need projects. I already got a whole a bunch of ones from Dan O'Han, uh, Polson. I hope to get some more from the other schools. So uh, I, we're going to have tables outside. Uh, First Congregational Church is helping us with that. They gave us the green, and they're going to, if someone needs a table, to provide it. How many people know Ranger Russ? Mm -hmm. Ranger Russ, he's the Indiana Jones of the shoreline, <laughs> right? He's the guy with that leather hat, walks around at the uh, Makes Point Nature Center. He's going to bring his whole tent full of wild animals to help, you know, get people stimulated. Uh, the people at Indian River Shellfish are fantastic. They are trying to uh, start a business. They're trying to grow oysters out in the Sound, right outside the Clinton Harbor, right by the Seal Rock area. They're going to come and show off their oysters, I think. Uh, i got a beekeeper. Uh, the Town of Madison, the Conservation Commission is going to have a table. I'm going to have some local experts on environment. We're gonna, if you want to do your home audit at your house, I'll have that, that company be there if you want to sign up again. And uh, this is my favorite. We're going to have an electric vehicle show. We're going to have uh, owners and the proud owners of their electric cars there. <laughs> available for you to come up, not to drive, I'm not going to let you drive it, but you can come up and ask questions awesome. and try to find out what it's really like to have an electric car. I own one, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got a lot, it, we'll try to answer your questions for you. Music, food, food's a little tough. I can't get a food truck. Everybody's booked and no. I'm too small. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anybody has any help there. We might have to go foodless. Have okay. you um, reached out to Chartwells, our food provider for the schools? No. Okay. Just follow up tomorrow yeah. with me. Okay. Yeah, they're outstanding. So great. They may possibly can help. Good. Yeah. We're going to get some uh, high school kids to be, be the music. Yep. And then at the end, we're going to have concluding remarks. We're going to have an expert. Uh, James O'Donnell is the, the the brains behind sea level rise in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. okay, he's not going to be that. He's he's got a Scottish brogue. He's great to listen to. Mm -hmm. He'll start us off, and then we're going to have some student advocates. We're still searching for the right yeah. candidates. And then we're going to end up with Senator Christine Cohen, who is the chairwoman of the, the Environmental Committee of the State of Connecticut. So that's that's what we got lined up. Um, what can you do for me? Well, number one, help me promote it. I, I could give you brochures. I have a green one and a white one. The green one goes online. The white one you can print. Uh, do whatever you can to help promote it. Encourage interdisciplinary projects throughout Earth Day if you haven't done already. You're Mr. Sustainability. Earth, this is Earth Week's coming. You should, I hope there's a whole bunch of things going to happen during that week. Do them, and then good, just share them there. But if you want to actually share them with the town, bring them to the expo, and we'll, we'll display them for you. I want this to be about kids, about youth. Um, and earlier on, if, okay, if you can't have a project, go out and pick up trash for us, like you did before. We'll give you the bags, the gloves. And you go out and we'll see if we can break a record of how much we collect. Uh, and all of you, please, continue to listen to kids. Get them involved. 
uh, they usually don't need much of an encouragement. They they do it themselves. They're smart about what's going on in the environment. Let's get them. Let's keep them involved. And so again, I just want to say, you know, make sure every day is Herb Day going forward. Pictures over here are from uh, last year. Um, Paulson helped me. Paulson? No, Ryerson. Ryerson helped me do the recycle mm -hmm. things to help me get the ban on plastic bags. The uh, the the, uh, the co-chair ladies of the uh, Echo Eco Club at Daniel Hand help us put the the, the watershed signs up. They're everywhere. That's yeah, great. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Great projects. Very nice. Trying to keep them involved. Yeah. That's, and that's our logo. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Fran. So this is great. Very exciting. You so is that the guest? Is yeah, that the guest? I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> you have been here at the 7:30, so you knew we needed a shot of positivity. Mm -hmm. Delivered. Thank, Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here on short notice too. I wanted to get it early. I'm glad. Thank you. Fran, follow up tomorrow with um, what we talked yeah. about, but also with the promotion. Uh, yes. we, we have a real strong effort. We can help with that, too. Great. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Just send me a quick email with those follow-up items. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So moving yeah, on. <laughs> so there's this little thing. <laughs> called COVID-19. <laughs> What's up? Um, so, Tom's going to give us an update. So prior to uh, another correspondence going out to staff and to parents, I wanted to start with the board just for a verbal report. It will be on the cable access as well and on our recorded video. Um, so a little bit of where we are now and where we're headed just so we can get a little uh, idea of what's going on and kind of what's uh, really coming right in the future right now and some decisions we'll have to make at some point. But I keep emphasizing, we don't make decisions internally in a vacuum. Trent Joseph, our, our Director of Public Health in Madison, has been outstanding. Uh, Stephanie Lesnick, who started as a nursing supervisor in January, <laughs> has, I said she didn't even get a chance to start in the fryer, she went right into the frying pan, has been an absolute all-star. And Dr. Karen Goldberg, our medical advisor, is, is responsive. Every time we send her a message, she's right back to us. They have been great. Um, our administrative team has met multiple times. They have joined us at those meetings. Uh, practical, specific, detailed questions. They're either, if they don't have the answer, they don't make it up. They get the information and get back to us. So our current protocols are, are in place, just to reiterate those again. And this is really, the board knows this, so just, this is for patience for me because I just want to make sure we get this on camera as well. Travel advisories. Um, if you are traveling to a level three country or from a level three country, the protocol did change. And the protocol changed to uh, a voluntary self-quarantine for students and staff. And we put that in place. And that has been in place. And the few people that we've had to address with that have been incredibly cooperative and understanding. I don't suspect we're gonna get a lot of South Korea, Iran, Italy, and Wuhan, China travelers in the near future. But the level three countries could add and change over time. So we have to be mindful of that as well, some other locations. Um, building cleaning practices. We have really up the ante. Um, you know, vacuuming is important, but if it's vacuuming or wiping down high touch areas, the custodians are gonna go to the wiping down of high touch areas. We've been given some latitude from the state and Bill's a better uh, person that can explain this thing than I can of the types of supplies and materials that we use now. They have uh, relieved some of those restrictions so we can use some stronger solutions and the custodians are, are on top of that. I think Saturday night was a great example um, at the um, event of what the custodians were able to do to kind of up their game. Student announcements and just an overall hand, hand washing campaign. Uh, you probably noticed we have signs all over the schools. I don't know, Wendy, do you have any idea how many signs that you made? It was over 100, right? It was. Yeah. Every what? corner. Yeah, every corner. <laughs> yeah. It's got a plaster yeah. there, right? And yeah. all of the central office. Yeah. Everybody, Everywhere. it was like an assembly line. Yeah, and yeah. So. And laminated and copied. Yep, so um, Henny up front, Wendy, Christine, a whole group of people, a ton of posters, a ton of reminders, sanitizers all over the buildings, all the new stations have been put up. Everywhere you walk, you've got a sanitizer. Um, buses. We've worked with uh, Durham Services so that after <coughs> the end of their morning runs, a complete wipe down of the seats, um, and they have upped the ante on the solution that they use as well. They've been given permission, and the same thing at the end of the day. Um, cafeterias, we have that as well. Um, we have a lot of time, not a lot of time, we have more time at the K level because you have a wave of kids come in. 
Um, high school's a little tricky because you guys like to trickle in and out, you know, during your lunches, but the folks in there still are vigilant to try to wipe down as much as they can. And Joe Bracco in the, um, uh, with Chartwells has done a great job also. They, they have high standards for, for uh, cleanliness in the kitchens already. So that's kind of overall where we are. Question? Where we're headed, uh, Governor had a conference call yesterday with um, really all the, all the public agencies, but superintendents were all on that call, but there were also towns and you know, selectmen, mayors, and so forth. Um, the public health state of emergency was declared, and honestly, we're, we're still looking for a little more clarity on what that means, and Trent Joseph's helping us and helping Peggy Lyons, our first select woman, on what that officially means. Um, it does give more latitude, obviously, to um, your public health directors in towns. Um, the CIAC, as we said before, had canceled all those events. Uh, we don't know if there's going to be an opportunity to rethink that or if the move is going to be towards the total cancellation of large gatherings of over 100 people. That's what the message was yesterday. If you have events where 100 or more people are going to be gathered, it's a cancellation. So um, there's some big events coming up that don't involve us. We have uh, primaries coming up in the state right now, and I think April, um, you know, presidential primaries and so forth. So there's a lot going on. Um, we have canceled field trips, and we will continue to do so. Um, we cancel international field trip, and through some strong parent advocacy and then some phone calls by Mr. Sanitary and myself, we were able to get replacement trips for the underclassmen, which were really safe because that was an expensive field trip. Uh, we also are on the precipice of making the same decision for the Florida trip, uh, which is for the show choir, vibe, and chorus. Um, highly unlikely, and we're making a decision probably this evening or tomorrow uh, to cancel that. And we did the best we could, and we still continue to do the best we can to kind of help them financially. It's, it's really tricky to do that at this point. Um, other field trips tomorrow, while I meet with the Administrative Council, and uh, in the afternoon, we meet with the town's emergency management preparedness. And together, we'll make decisions looking at the calendar from now until the end of the year. I don't know if a blanket cancellation is appropriate or maybe a month, six weeks, eight weeks. I'm going to take my guidance from Trent Joseph and from uh, the other advisors as far as um, the nature of how long we should extend, if we should just postpone, and so forth. So but much more will come out tomorrow. Uh, there will be parent communication, as I said. Um, we have guidance from um, the uh, whole child wellness team is putting together some guidance for parents on, especially for younger kids, you know, how do you talk about it? There, there, there's a lot of fear mongering going on right now, either in, incidentally, unintentionally, or intentionally, and our kids are hearing about it. So we feel a responsibility to at least give parents a couple of nuggets of how do you talk to your child about this, in addition to you know, if we can give help you know, and advice on certain kind of hygiene and, and so forth. Um, we'll also talk in broad terms about closures because we do not have specific information. I'll get into some more detail about that in a second. Uh, a faculty communication will go out tomorrow as well because closures and how we will deal with that in short term and long term. Uh, we've been thinking about that internally. The calendar question. Um, the state is um, unbending on 180 days as a minimum. And um, every effort has to be made to make those days up before any consideration is put forward for waiving um, the 180 day minimum. So uh, we do have a chart that was handed out to us um, to the State Department of Ed, which I'll give to board members in a second. And it relates to short term and long term closures. Um, and a couple of statements before I hand that out from, from the State Department on this information. Um, any closures uh, that uh, have not been directed by federal or state officials will be local decisions. And any closures that are directed by federal and state officials, we've been assured will not be done in a silo. So there will be regional communication like we have been having. Um, any declaration from the governor or federal government um, <clears throat> will be done in conjunction with regions. Otherwise, local districts will have the right, as we always do, to call for school closures. Um, the state law, this is a quote, allows the Connecticut State Board of Education to authorize a shorter school year, for example, one less than 180 days, where there are emergency circumstances, and this is important, schools should exhaust all other options to make up any lost school days. 
A local school district's request for consideration should be directed to the commissioner and requests will be given consideration for approval by the State Board of Ed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the, the message that we're getting pretty loud and clear is that distance learning, any kind of opportunity to learn from home, is really not in play in lieu of an on-site school day. So I think there was some early hope from a lot of districts that we will be able to provide distance learning and check the box on 180 days. The challenge is that we still have to comply with all state and federal laws if we're going to provide that type of instruction. And we have to provide for all special education programs and accommodations, and IEPs, goals. And the district will assume the risk. And that's a quote on the chart that I'm going to hand out to you. I don't think it's wise to assume risk that we can deliver IEPs until we get further information from the state on, on that type of level. Now, we have days to play with still within the month of June, um, and, and we can consider that. Uh, I asked Gail to begin to look at, and she's been doing this work with regional uh, uh, super, assistant superintendents, we're all kind of working together. What would a short-term kind of closure look like? Could be up to, I say two weeks. And then what could a long-term closure? Now, a little bit more clarity on the short term right now. The long term, we have work to do as, as a region, really. We're all kind of talking about it. Gail, do you want, I can hand out the chart. Do you, want the chart to, you want to do it up there first? Sure. Yeah. Can I ask a question about, it, it's to contain or stop the spread of. Yes. It's not when there's an outbreak to isolate. It is to stop the spread of. I don't think it's either or. The virus. Yeah, I don't think it's either or. They they have said that the closures would be used and could be used in the same way as the elimination of large gatherings. So the opportunity to spread is significantly reduced. Sure. But it also could be used if, if there is evidence of the virus in a school, then the closure would also be used to you know, okay. kind of react to that. But um, it hasn't been ruled out to do closures even before that happens. So um, we get information daily on this. And it's so there's no strict parameters yeah. on what to look for in order to know to, if you're making that decision. It's a local decision. Gotcha. That's the parameter they're giving okay. us. Love it. <laughs> just want to clarify that. This is, um, this is an important chart. And I'm just going to review this and then hand it off to Gail. So not the clearest. I apologize for that. Um, this was the summary. That top bubble, uh, superintendent uh, determines the appropriate closure. And, and the left side there are short-term closures up to two weeks. I think what's key here is that one option is no distance learning in lieu of on-site schooling. And if you read anything, I think you just read SCE recommended. So they're looking for us to exhaust all of our days, like snow days, yeah. okay? Um, the other option is distance learning. Uh, LEA determines locally, but it's really important Distance learning effectively employed, accessible, the LEA, which is the district, accepts risk. Consider staff and contractual issues, special education access, et cetera. So you've got two very, very different pieces of information there. And without mandating it, there's some very strong language here from our interpretation that we ought to go with this option here, the no distance learning in lieu of online, the closure and the makeups. So um, that's the approach that we've looked at so far. Uh, on the far right is the longer term, which is really uncharted waters. So you're closed for 15, 20 or so school days. I think if we enter that world, I think all districts are in the same boat. It's March, what, 10th? We have till June 30th. I don't think there's a way possible for us to make up those days between now and June 30th. The state's gonna have to work with districts. I can't imagine how they would have to work graduation requirements uh, as far as seat time class long-term closures yeah I mean you know I could it's a good question I could be a senior who needs my civics I waited didn't take my civics class <laughs> until my last trimester <laughs> you didn't do that and help <laughs> <And help. laughs> yes. um, <laughs> that's a great one on um, AP uh, UConn courses so interesting conversation in the hallway I spent a lot of time at the high school today conversation with an incredibly talented teacher who teaches an ECE UConn course who's on the email distribution list for UConn. Now UConn is sending out a message to their faculty about moving to an online approach at stores and at their campuses. Well, he interpreted it to me him. 
And I thought, I don't know if that applies in a high school just yet. Hold on, you know, you're on a distribution list. So, but it raises another question. There's so many unanswered questions, and the in fairness, the State Department of Ed and the Department of Public Health are buried right now. Well, and, this is uncharted waters. Yeah. I mean, who would have? I appreciate just the clarity of just a simple chart yeah. like this, yeah. because you know we're getting documents, which are great. But everybody that I know is sending me, hey, did you see this? Hey, did you see that? Like, I love the one sheeter with bubbles. I mean, this is great. It's straight. I would like, you know, we have copies from the board of this. The other piece that uh, we've talked about is the calendar. Because right now on the calendar, and this is the board adopted calendar, there's language at the bottom that says, and this is going to require the glasses. Because it's really small. CBS Cheers. <laughs> Makeup days for unscheduled school closings will be added to the end of the school year through June 30th. Uh, additional days will be deducted from the April break, beginning with April 6th, working towards forward to April 10th. <laughs> so we have to consider if closures happen before the April break, um, using those days if we've already exhausted to June 30th. So there's a lot of moving parts here right now, and this could all happen fast. So you saw in Westchester, you know, New Rochelle today is under quarantine with National Guard. Um, that happened in a matter of maybe a week. So I think things can change quickly. Um, I don't know what we have done much besides this for the past, I think, maybe two weeks. Um, and there's, you know, I, th I think we're approaching it in a very reasonable way. Um, you know, we definitely have protocols in place to keep us safe. The medical advisors have been outstanding in advising us, you know, Wash your hands, wash your hands, good hygiene, all those good things. Um, stay calm, uh, but take it seriously, which is what we're doing. So I'd like for Gail to share with the board short-term and long-term hypotheticals and how we can approach things uh, with some of the work that's been done and that will be forthcoming. So go ahead, Gail. Sure. Um, so phase one, uh, if you look at those two bubbles, the either side uh, situation, Short-term closures, we're treating as a phase one. Long-term closure and state and federal um, inserting orders along the way is uh, kind of our phase two. So I'm gonna bring you through each phase and where we are. Um, so phase one, uh, we are actively working as a <coughs> regional group through LEARN. Um, the assistant superintendents have met several times and tomorrow is a full day at LEARN with um, teachers and practitioners from across the regions and we're grouping together to uh, create some tasks and I'll give some examples of that. Um, in addition to that, we have some things that we're accessing as well, um, more in keeping with the work that we did uh, around uh, keeping kids engaged during the summertime. So we took a lot of work um, and a lot of active um, participation in that. So I'm going to share with you just some of the things that we came up with at LEARN. And again, this is a full day tomorrow. So you can see the way we're approaching it is we're developing some tasks for a 9 through 12 STEM um, experience, a 9 through 12 humanities, 6 through 8 STEM, and 6 through 8 humanities, then a 3 through 5 grouping, and a pre-K through 2. Um, so that's our clustering and what we've been doing. We're uh, using standards to inform our development of um, those uh, tasks. They can be as complicated as something like this. This is something that we contributed that leads off of one of our grade two um, more complex designs. This task is organized around a two week study from home where students really look at uh, plant growth um, and try to design an experiment. Now for our kids, this will be a familiar task because they did it in a classroom setting um, based on a farmer, but this would actually ask them to take that learning and apply it to their own garden and their garden development at home. So there would be a chance for a student checklist and a parent. That one's a several day one. Um, another one that we um, came up with as an example is okay, I'm sorry. this work does, does or does not presume like online or, or technology? This does not okay. presume. So what this design, the two-week plan, is designed to do is to keep kids engaged as an option for parents. 
It's not meant to take the place of a class that you're currently taking. And it's not credit. No. It's not credit based, it's not graded. It's purely if you want to keep your child engaged in a variety of tasks and activities. Continuity of learning as much as we can. Yeah, the reason why it was approached that way and the advice from the state was to approach it that way is it's virtually impossible to figure out what day you're going to start the two week period and what day you're going to end. Um, that being said, also across the region we have kids in different units at different times and different designs. Um, so again, this is just meant to pull from a variety of resources. So this is a sixth grade challenge one. This is a lower uh, kind of activity or a shorter activity than the first one I showed you. Um, and it's really about becoming a, a lawyer and your first client is Jack from Jack and the Beanstalk. And it's really uh, creating an argument about whether Jack was a hero or a criminal. Um, so those, some, those are some keen examples from that. But in addition, I wanted to point out that probably some students have never accessed this link, Jackie. Um, but <laughs> under the student Jackie, yes, you're here to you tonight. If you look under the summer button, um, and hopefully you have, but maybe you haven't, we have a really active um, summer plan for readers. We have actually uh, book talks, recording sheets, and mathematics. Um, we have I'll hit a, a high school math, we've actually created um, links to online resources for kids to have mini lessons, and then also practice problems for Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, Calculus. So in reading and mathematics, we really have done quite a bit for our summer packets and all the different levels. And what we're trying to do now is to curate that information, and I've got uh, Don and Mike working on some web design that I want to share with you. So it would look something like this, where parents would um, receive a page with lots of links and active links as to different activities that they can do and choose from to keep their students engaged. So you can see activities for entering grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, um, different kinds of skill sets. And then we're also adding to all of this the work that we're doing at Learn. So it should be a pretty comprehensive uh, two-week um, optional activity. And that's the important part, too, is that you have to realize that in phase one, you know, it's optional learning. It's not for grading or turning in. However, <coughs> kids might choose to curate it through their Google Drive. So that's um, phase one. Any questions about that so far? That's great. It should go out. Our, our design is is that everything would go out um, as parents receive the notice. So as they receive notice that schools are closing for a period of time, we would also give them a lot of resources and a lot of choice and options. Recognizing that some families will decide to um, pursue that and some may not. In phase two, this is a, a more of a challenge and what we have going into that phase two um, that's unique to Madison is this community design that we've approached curriculum with. So because we've had entire teams of teachers that teach the same grade level at the same course, they always have had common assessments since their curriculum adoption and some guaranteed experiences. The other thing that we have here in Madison that's unusual is we have a web-based software that actually curates all of our curriculum that any teacher, special ed, regular ed, within the discipline, outside of the discipline, can access that unit in order to look at the learning plan. And I'm gonna share with you what that looks like. Um, the product is um, EduPlanet 21. We've had it for several years. Um, it's highly unusual to curate curriculum this way, um, but you'll see the benefits in just a moment. <clears throat> so in the future, if I'm a special education teacher, and special education teachers now can do that, I can take a look at grade eight science, and I can pick a unit and see what's up and coming in grade eight. So I picked an astronomy course, just because it's easy to download. Um, here's the assessment evidence. It's this detailed. It has all of the links to the Google Drive. It's already decided on what the common assessments are for our teachers. So they don't have to collaborate on that part, they've already done it. Then there's the learning plan, which is the actual lessons, and there are video clips linked to that. 
So this exists in every discipline that we've adopted so far. So this is a huge advantage that we have in terms of our distance learning design um, that I think is really unique to Madison. And families would need, if we get there, would need access to that? Families uh, would not have access to that, but our teachers would, and they would be able to pull from wherever they are in order to create those common experiences because they've already designed it that way. Um, so that's what we have. So in phase two, again, we'd be uh, collaborating as a regional group. We'd be curating what we have. Um, we'd also be determining on a local level what our digital access is and we would be leveraging our own department's work because we know that our curriculum is going to be different than the region. But we'd probably pull and collaborate the way we have to um, make it the best learning experience possible. So that's where we are and uh, the status. So I, I'm feeling, uh, you know, I guess as good as you can feel in terms of level of preparedness for something that's never been experienced. Um, but we do have some advantages. I just want to caution you know, the, the entire community on the fact that getting out in front and just being the first to do something without understanding all the unintended consequences, we have to be really cautious about that. Yeah. So um, we, to advance with something and not know, one of the best questions asked was one of the superintendents yesterday on the conference call, if we apply for a waiver, how do we know if we'll get it? And there's no criteria right now. So to assume a day will count is, is a real dangerous proposition. So I think the one thing that we know we have time because we'll close for a period of time and we can engage in that first level before if there is a longer closure. Thank you. How is this going to affect the standardized testing like SVACs? And they, uh, the state had said that they're going to work with that. It was a little blurb, actually I can read that. Um, that they are going to do their best to figure that out. Um, we do have a bigger window. Um, we're at their mercy uh, when it comes to that. Oh, I think I have a statement for that. So all state assessments offer either extended testing windows over several weeks or multiple testing dates that are at least two weeks apart, like the SAT. Um, if in spite of this flexibility, the state assessment administration in a district is hampered due to unavoidable school closures resulting from COVID-19 outbreak, then the State Department will explore solutions that will enable the district to complete the administration of the mandated assessment. Kind of boilerplate general, because they're going to work with us, I guess. Any question? Um, are the teachers aware of all of um, the work that you're doing to get ready for um, that type of distance? They will be tomorrow. Okay. Yes, we wanted to talk to the You're board. The first. Yes, talk to the board tonight, and um, I am working on. Uh, I really want to send a reassuring message to the teachers. I don't want people going out and advancing this work in vain. So let's be doing this together and making sure we're measured. That first level of continuity of learning and keeping engagement in the event of a school closure is is rather low level from my perspective. When you advance it and you're looking at, we can't deliver instruction, okay? So you're looking at an online distance learning platform. That's different than a classroom teacher meeting with kids. Um, so one at a time. But tomorrow is a parent message and a staff message. And there are probably 10 teachers working across the distance on that phase one. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If there's a closure, especially if there's a longer term closure, has the administration begun discussing um, plans for kids who might experience food insecurity due to we have not uh, the only conversation that came up with that was actually on the town side it wasn't just a school yep. um, problem um, it did come up with um, uh, one of our meetings last week maybe um, it was uh, I think Trent Joseph brought that up so it came up but there is not a plan for that right now we did check on our free and reduced lunch rates here in district and we're at four or five percent about and then, Meals on Wheels, the town program. Yeah, well, like I said, we haven't really gone deeply on that at all. Uh, comment, two questions. Comment is, uh, thank you for this, and I, I mentioned to you earlier uh, directly, I thought your communications that you've put out to this point have been very good content-wise and um, timing-wise, so thank you for that. Uh, I guess the two questions, one is looking at the bubble. <laughs> yeah, that triggers uh, the short-term closure. Yep. So it looks like the local health officials 
are working with you and may lead to sort of the discussion saying, you know, we've, we've triggered a short-term closure. Do you feel comfortable? You have sort of a meeting of the minds with the local folks as to what their variables are for St. Thomas time to yeah. pull the trigger? So a couple things. It's an absolute gift to be right here. You know, Tr Trent Joseph and I spent a lot of time together. Yeah. Um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a wonderful guy, energetic. Um, he gets his information from his regional group, which is from the state group, which is largely from the CDC. So he comes immediately. Uh, calls myself, text, stops over, whatever. Here's what we got to do. Uh, Peggy Lyons has been outstanding. Um, at four o'clock, you know, just today she called me up. We're going to do a town message. Can we coordinate our messages? Absolutely, because my, my philosophy is I don't want to keep communicating for the sake of communicating. I want to keep a nice cadence with it. And tomorrow's appropriate because things are starting to ramp up a little bit. Some people will want information every day and every minute, and that's really not feasible, nor is it really, I think, reasonable. But Peggy's going to communicate on the town side, and we're going to synchronize. So those are two folks on that side that have been outstanding when it comes to that support. And I think when those decisions have to be made, um, we'll have really good guidance. Sir. The, the only question I have, before you even get to that point, yeah. and you may have covered this already, have you had any, without getting into details, have you had any individual families with students who may have already pre-existing conditions for like immunity? Um, susceptible that may need like a, a, a yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. intervention. So Stephanie Lesick, our nursing supervisor, um, weeks ago had uh, already talked with her nurses about their health protocols that they had dealt with internally in their schools. Um, the central office administration, principals are aware, central office has not been involved at that individual student level, but the nurses have at that school have the kids they know to be mindful of. What is the plan for um, alerting parents when there's a specific incident? I know I communicated to you an incident um, uh, regarding a parent concerned about possible exposure from a teacher to a classroom and that. Um, so what is the plan there? Because I know there's confidentiality yeah, concerns true. there. Yeah, no. um, and I don't know if you get a chance to follow up on that because of the other things going on. Yeah, well, we uh, talked to the town side too about that because it, it's, I, I present it as more of just a global thing than just a classroom because it's a community thing. I mean, when someone gets in a community, it's on the news. So um, I'm waiting for some more information on as far as the, the HIPAA piece and as far as the confidentiality piece. When you get into a student realm, now you've got, you've got HIPAA and FERPA kind of working together <laughs> as one big bubble. Um, but at this point in the game, um, I'm going to follow the town's lead. If we have something, if, if they have a duty to report, and legally that I have a duty to report, then there'll be some type of report. I think the balancing act is right now is based on our early incidents. We have a very, very heightened awareness uh, and sensitivity to the stigmatizing that's already happened unfairly. So we're really trying to balance that out with the right to know and the stigmatizing that we've already experienced. Um, so I am going to follow the town's lead on that because they, they certainly have a reporting requirement. So we have to report to them if we're aware of something because there's certain reporting requirements that are a threshold for Trent Joseph to report to the state agency. If there is a positive diagnosis, uh, I need to know, you know, working in conjunction. But Tom Mooney, our attorney, will certainly guide us on the HIPAA for piece. And specifically the incident that I um, emailed to you about, did you get a chance to follow up on that specific? Because it's sort of a hearsay um, that a, a teacher had traveled to Italy and came back, but was symptom free, came yeah. to school, and then the uh, level three change. We had to the change the protocol while and the so teacher was now here. The teacher yeah. went home under self. Um, yep but that the students of the classroom were told about it, but the parents were not. Oh, um, no, you know what? I have a statement that actually, what was read to the classes, the script that I have right here, is that um, the teacher is out, the sub is in today. Um, you all probably know that the teacher recently traveled overseas, decided to stay home for the rest of the week, is not sick, feels perfectly well, and wants the students to know so rumors aren't flying. She'll be back next week, and teaching class for the next few days is a substitute. That's all that was said. Um, what in, got interpreted possibly outside of that, um, I don't know. Um, inadvertent comment by another staff member, 
could have happened, but this was the script that we authorized. So if there so was. And that was read to the class of students. It was, yeah. And, but there was nothing communicated to the parents of the students. No. So I think that was the issue that was mentioned to me, that there was, the parent was upset because her um, child came home telling her this and, you know, hearsay, the sure. words get changed. Um, but the fact that it, the school did not communicate directly to the parents of the children that this occurred, even though it was asymptomatic, whatever, just the fact that they felt they needed to know. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's hard because it's constantly moving and changing, and um, it is unnerving. And I'm watching closely. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have to. You have to borrow. You have to borrow. Oh, okay. Yeah. We've all been leaving each other. Yeah. So. <clears throat> and I got to say, the commissioner has been the new commissioner, Miguel Cardona. What a gentleman. Great. He has been so responsive, returning phone calls. He's just really yeah. very helpful. Yeah, but they're just inundated right now. We'll get through it. Thanks. Definitely. Last, um, I just have one other. I'm going to do a positive. So you all know we closed the school last year. Did you guys know that? And we have a reconfiguration plan we're still in the midst of, and it has been incredibly successful. Um, and one indicator that I wanted to share is that we changed the model at Brown, and we changed it to an intermediate model with two teacher teams. So one of the concerns we had was around how are we going to be able to conference and communicate with parents and so forth when you have two teachers? So the, after the October conferences, the teachers were a little discouraged because they were dividing and conquering. So they asked if we can come up with some accommodations to help them. And I asked Mr. Henderson, um, you know, what is the level and magnitude of communication that our Brown teachers have done so far? Because it's pretty standard at the elementary school. You have one teacher, you meet with that teacher. Um, and so this is a different model. So since October 1st, the Brown Core teachers, along with any special ed teachers uh, where needed, have conducted over 650 parent conferences at Brown. They've taken place during early release days in October, February, as well as dedicated days for each team to meet with individual parents. The multiple conferences taken place during teacher planning time per parent request if needed or teacher. Before school, after school, over the phone, and I think we've done a couple of FaceTimes. Um, and uh, the, uh, the two-person the two -person team model for the teachers at Brown, uh, the teachers have gone above and beyond to accommodate parents. It's, it's just different for parents because they haven't had that experience where Brown's conferences in the past were student-led. They weren't done this way. Um, so to have the elementary approach with two teachers, I, the teachers are just unbelievable what they've been able to do to accommodate. So I want to so end with a So 650 positive. conferences, how many kids are in the school? 300 and, I, mean, I don't know, 320? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I was going to say 338. Yeah, yeah, you might be right. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah, they've been outstanding. So. I just want to say, as a parent of a fifth grader at Brown, I like the two teacher conferences. It's just different dynamic you get from different teachers. It's a team. It's more adults that your child is learning and interacting with. I, I think it's a super model. And they really seem to work well together, too. Well, they share that they like to hear their peer. Talking oh, I'm about sure the child. Do. I'm too. sure. Yeah, a number of them said that. They just see the student maybe in different ways, but yeah. I think it's excellent. We've got, you know, the model was created on paper. It was never really done before, so we had an opportunity to put it in place. And this was one thing that missed the mark in October. There's no question. The yeah. October conferences were certainly lacking, and the teachers came to us, and Frank responded, and so good feedback. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Is that a hand up, Kathy? That's great. Just an answer. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Um, board member comments. Uh, I have comments. Um, I actually have two. Um, one is um, something that I had uh, contacted Tom about. Um, I was approached. Uh, there was concern about the bathroom use in the high school. And I just wanted to bring it up because like, I didn't know the policy. and. Um, I don't know if anyone else is aware. So uh, a friend of a friend uh, has a son who attends hand and uh, went to use the bathroom facilities. And uh, another student came in who was transitioning gender. And so he felt uncomfortable using the bathroom at the same time. So the question was posed to me, what is the policy for the bathroom use in the schools? And I didn't have an answer. Um, so I said, 
contact principal, contact Tom. Great job. And so Tom came back with an answer. Now, if you want to take over with yeah, that. Yeah, thank you for the segue. Um, in 2017, the governor had an executive order, Governor Malloy at the time, um, that had declared the parameters for public restrooms, which included any public institutions and any public schools. Um, so the students, um, and, and not just students, any, any citizen in any public restroom um, would have access to a bathroom to which they identify with. So we follow the governor's executive order. Though we do have solo bathrooms, single bathrooms, I think uh, um, Eric and, and Jackie know on, I believe, each floor. Uh, definitely on the first and second floor. We have single bathrooms, and kids can choose to use that as well. Um, and kids know that those bathrooms are accessible to them. I know the first floor one. First floor one, one yeah. I'm not sure, but not, not the third. I think maybe a second floor, but definitely the first floor one. Yeah. Oh, and the other comment was, um, my child goes to Polson, and I just wanted to say that they did an outstanding job um, on Monday um, regarding the loss of a teacher. And she said that she felt very supported, and um, all of the students were supporting each other, and the support the teachers were supporting the students, the students were supporting the teachers, mm -hmm. and just it was very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just um, want to, I was um, invited last night to give um, a welcome address um, for um, the beginning of Women's History Month at um, a panel discussion um, where Keelan Vergolto, um, not for school credit, not for any reason other than the importance of, of doing this and wanting to recognize it, brought an, um, ex um, an exhibit from the um, Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. Um, the theme this year is women's suffrage because it's the 100th anniversary. Um, so I was um, invited to give the welcome address and um, was humbled to be in the presence of so many accomplished um, women, Mary Barnaby being one of them. Um, and um, and Keelan led. Um, yeah, <laughs> Keelan. I um, hear that occasionally. <laughs> Keelan led a really um, riveting and powerful um, panel um, for these women to um, answer questions about challenges that um, that we all face. Um, so um, I just wanted to acknowledge her hard work and um, her contribution to um, the medicine that was really, really, really well done. Wasn't she also a past recipient uh, award? Yeah. 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 yeah, she has an older sister as well that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Who started the Tiger Tracks program. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So, that's it. Any, any other comments? Okay, so moving on to liaison um, reports, curriculum and student development. Okay, um, the curriculum and student development meeting met February 25th. We uh, covered two of the three items on our agenda. Um, the first was the art curriculum work presented by Bill Summer, um, who is still who is working his way through the curriculum. Um, he talked about um, the creative cycle, um, the importance of a sketchbook for students, embedded in 21st capacity, uh, the capacities into the matrix, uh, vertically aligning the art program and he discussed course offerings at, uh, at Daniel Hand. Um, I believe, um, in particular, he, we covered the uh, transition from darkroom to digital to a portfolio approach for, for art. It was very well done. Um, the second item of the agenda was a detailed look at the history of our first grade ELA uh, program, uh, going back to 2010, 2011. Um, it was very in-depth, um, and I cannot possibly do it justice <laughs> in this report. Um, so I, I, um, I think that a question and answer approach would probably be more suited. Um, if anybody has questions on, I th we had pretty good attendance um, there, but um, uh, the themes were basically the implementation of the curriculum writing cycle, the the uh, curriculum review committee. Um, it was uh, started in 2011-2013. We're in the monitoring and evaluating phase, and um, you know, are there any questions? 
please feel free. I will gladly defer to Gail. <laughs> <laughs> it's very well done. Yeah. Very rich discussion. A lot of work. Well. Okay. Oh. Um, communications committee. Yes, the communications committee met tonight, and we had a very full agenda focusing on the school facilities renewal plan and communication and outreach as part of that. Um, Zoe has done an incredible job of putting together a timeline leading up to the October 6th referendum. Um, there are four public information sessions that have been scheduled that will be made available more information to the community. We will have one at Ryerson on March 30th, one at Jeffrey on April 20th, one at Polson on June 1st, and then one in September to be determined. Um, lots of information that will be going out there on the website, informational materials. She's put together great information on what a yes vote would mean, what a no vote would mean, what the ramifications are for those votes in terms of our facilities, the schools, the cost, um, as well as she's generating a list of frequently asked questions that is very comprehensive, um, that will be great for our outreach, public information, sharing with other folks. Um, if there is anything that you come upon in the community or hear from um, from folks, please do send my way or directly to Zoe as we continue to work on it. But there's um, a lot of really great information that she's putting together. And I just want to underscore March 30th, there will be a public, the first public yes. information session. Is that right? Tell all your friends and save the date. Yeah. Is that referendum date? Definitive. Yes, the Board of Selectmen voted a couple weeks ago now. Two weeks ago, it's definitive. October, yeah. Tuesday, October 6th is the date. And why that date over the November date? Oh, boy. That I can. A, I, source. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I can. I get it from my community. <laughs> really well, I can. I was at the meeting um, where it was decided, um, and there were a lot of things that went into making that decision, not the least of which was um, the quiet period. And for a standalone referendum, the quiet period can extend into the beginning of the school year, whereas for a November um, federal election, we would have to stop communicating to the public before school begins. That was a big one. The second one that I consider to be a big one um, was the um, registrar of voters. Um, because it is a presidential election and some people who would might be voting um, for a tax capital question would not be eligible to vote for the presidential because they might have their permanent residence they pay taxes here but their permanent residency is elsewhere so we would have to have two separate ballots a lot of confusion she felt like it would be between people registering to vote that day and all of the hullabaloo with a general election adding um, a, a town or municipal question would have been really problematic and confusing. So those were the two highlights for me that made it pretty clear that, um, I add to that that most capital um, project referendums in our town have been standalone. Um, they aren't usually coupled with another item. So I think those were the big highlights. Again, it wasn't our decision. Um, I think it's fair to say that, um, the Board of Education put some pressure on making a decision so we could start working on our, our communications plan. Um, but um, I'm just happy there's one now so that we can move forward. But yeah, it was a, it was their ultimate decision. Any other questions? Okay, anything that my committee colleagues want to add to that? Anything we're missing for communications? <coughs> no, I think, it, uh, I think you did a, a good, not surprise, I think you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I definitely married out. <laughs> she didn't do that once last night. No, I'm sure she did. Facilities Committee. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, very briefly, the Facilities Committee met on uh, February 25th. Uh, Phil McMinn was uh, in attendance. Uh, we covered uh, generally three um, topics that night. 
Um, Bill gave us an update uh, on some of the upcoming, including summer work that he's doing, including the Florin Project, um, my memory is fading, I believe in Brown, uh, coming up, uh, give some details on that. Um, then uh, Bill and Tom talked a little bit, I would say conceptually, about the uh, Green Hill property, uh, looking at an overall site map and talking conceptually again about placement of the elementary school, both current and future, and what that whole site looks like, what the wetlands are like. Um, and so again, more conceptually rather than any kind of formal action. Um, and then the third piece, um, Bill uh, mentioned to us that he's uh, currently assessing, I believe, um, contracts for uh, uh, turf field management uh, mm -hmm. vendors. And it brought up, a, a, you know, Bill actually introduced this, because this is a relatively still new committee uh, to the board, the standards by which we review you know, budgets or Bill's actions, whether it's content or financial, are still not really well defined. And Bill's kind of encouraging us as a committee to think like, what do you guys want from me, gals? Um, what do you want from me, and how should we assess that? So when we reconvene on March 19th, um, that would be an example of something that we'll take a look at and have a discussion with uh, Bill. That's anything else from the committee? No. Okay. Personnel. Finance. Thank you, finance. Sorry, I'm so sorry. No, I've been not. so mean to you today. I'm sorry. You're not the least bit sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, but the finance committee has not met. Uh, <laughs> however, we do continue to um, uh, to watch uh, Tom uh, give the budget presentation in front of oh, yeah. seemingly endless number of uh, opportunities or, or board meetings. And the numbers don't change, and the presentation continues yeah. to be well done. Stay the same. <laughs> Policy. Personal. Oh, personal. 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 See, Everybody. I checked too early. I checked my people. Okay. Now, policy. Uh, policy committee has not met since our last meeting. Uh, you will see that we have one first reading for policy on reporting distribution of materials and uh, many second readings in front of you tonight. Uh, there are five total, and we have uh, policy committee has received a question. Love questions. Um, <laughs> Was it a calling question? We don't usually get questions, but we'll take it. Uh, where we received a request for clarification about why we would rescind entirely policy 1210, which is the second reading, parent teacher organizations, and policy 1325, advertising and promotion. I can mention uh, before I turn it over to Tom that the uh, policy committee uh, heard. Uh, that most of the reasoning behind this is that these are likely to be unnecessary policies in our policy handbook uh, that may cause more liability than they saw. And so we uh, voted unanimously to recommend to the board that we rescind those policies. So, Tom. So, um, that's a great segue. So we switched from CAVE, uh, providing our policy uh, guidance to Shipman and Goodwin. Um, the difference, one of the biggest differences in the two is that uh, Shipman is, is really big on if you don't need a policy by law, be very, very cautious of adding the policy. Uh, both of these are not mandatory and it could create a, a threshold, and this is just an overall guidance that they provide. It could create a, a threshold that's just unnecessary for the board to meet to. Um, so that's number one. They're not mandatory and Shipman's normal protocol to not recommend if it's not mandatory. Um, the PTO in particular, they're independent nonprofit organizations. Um, there's concerns that any allusion to oversight by the board could lead to liability for the Board of Ed. It's just unnecessary. So um, PTOs are going to exist, they're going to operate, and they ought to independently as nonprofits. And our thrive. we have tremendous PTO support, and, and they're run incredibly well. Um, so that's, that's probably the reason for 1210, I think, why shipping shies away from that. As far as advertising and promotion, uh, 1325, uh, again, not mandatory, and there was a question really about relevancy. You know, was it really a relevant policy to maintain um, and to keep up with? Um, so those were the main points. Um, I could dig in deeper, you know, if, uh, if necessary. But just, no. just to provide a little more context about, for example, the parent-teacher organization's yeah. policy and the discussion we had. First of all, the policy was last reviewed in 1989. Um, just a year I barely remember and I said that for Katie's sake and the that uh, it, it says things like there shall 
There shall only be one parent-teacher organization recognized by the Board of Education in each school as determined by majority vote of the parents, legal guardians, and teachers of students in the school. And I don't remember that election happening <laughs> ever, no, nor is it likely to ever occur. So and there are things like that in there. That the are just, they're the primary communication for the district. Right? Yeah. It's also in there. Yeah. Like before email existed. And don't be fooled by the names of the policies. Yeah. Really go in and read them. No, nope, that's, a, that's a hard no from the audience. <laughs> So she's out of a job. Right. Exactly. <laughs> the PTOs have taken done. over. Yeah, yeah. I have a whole coronavirus update. You PTOs want to give that? <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of parents who'd like to hear it. Yeah, they will. <laughs> and according to our policy, they should be delivering it. Yeah. <laughs> Create again, actually. Unless there are further questions. No. And report. Thank you. CIP committee. We have not met. We have not met, and we're. We're finished. Yeah. So the summer. Yep. Uh, Lord liaison. Um, we met February 13th and we're also meeting this week. Um, the last meeting actually took place at the Ocean Avenue Learning Academy. Mm -hmm. They wanted to um, share the proposal for their renovation of the second floor because they're currently only using the first floor and they gave a tour um, and then there was an informational presentation. Um, and then the legislative update, they reviewed the REST Alliance proposal for a statewide database and interactive tool for specialized student transportation. And they're continuing to work towards a regional solution for cost savings um, and sharing of services. And the other updates, um, they had, they're closing the dual language and arts magnet middle school. They have been unsuccessful in finding a place to house the school. And so it will be closing at the end of this year in June and a uh, principal resigned from the Marine Science Magnet High School. They got a Connecticut River Academy earned the Magnet School of Distinction Award, and they approved a grant application for a funding opportunity for the, that Breast Alliance proposal for the statewide database. <coughs> um, audience response. Um, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. I need a motion to approve the minutes of the February 11th, 2020 Board of Education meeting. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Or discussion? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Any old business? Future agenda items? Meetings and dates of importance are attached. I need a motion to adjourn. So we should move. All Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Here.